Hillary Putnam, a follower of Chairman Mao. Mao demanded that university staff leave their lecture rooms and join with the peasants in the labor of the fields, a requirement that delighted many liberal academics on American and European campuses, though surprisingly few of them rushed to engage in these enriching activities themselves. Michael Lynch. Hillary Putnam was indisputably a central figure in contemporary philosophy. When he died in March 2016, the New York Times published an obituary calling him a giant of modern philosophy. Over a long career, he made a number of far-reaching contributions to the philosophy of mathematics, the philosophy of language, the philosophy of mind, the philosophy of science and metaphysics. He received numerous professional recognitions, including the most prestigious ones like the Prometheus Prize of the American Philosophical Association, the Rolf Schock Prize, the Launer Prize for an outstanding oeuvre in analytical philosophy, and the Nicholas Rescher Prize for systematic philosophy. A lover of wisdom joins a cult. From 1968 to 1972, while he was in his 40s, Putnam was a member of the Progressive Labor Party, PLP, which the historian Ronald Radosh called a Marxist-Leninist sect that made the Communist Party look like a group of tame reformists. Since some readers may regard Radosh as biased against the left, it should be noted that Martha Nussbaum, an academic with impeccable liberal credentials, described the PLP in a similar way as a cult. The Progressive Labor Party, the part of the SDS, Students for a Democratic Society, that was prominent at Harvard, always struck me as a corporatist and totalitarian movement, a cult in all but name. People I knew were ordered to marry, or, as the case may be, to leave their marriages for the sake of correct political values. People would say quite seriously absurd things, such as, we are getting married to emulate the lifestyle of the workers. Children were suddenly told not to talk to some adult they loved because that person had the wrong view on some microsliver of revolutionary politics. The PLP newspaper called Challenge quoted many people, but all of them talked the same Maoist jargon, suggesting to me that either they were not quoted correctly or they had been brainwashed into a kind of group speak. Hillary Putnam used to sell Challenge on the street corner in Harvard Square. A former member of the party describes it thus, the progressive labor handle was the brainstorm of a couple of Buffalo, New York steelworkers who had been booted out of the Communist Party USA for espousing the Albanian tendency and, in the process, had embraced not only the glorious thoughts of Enver Hoxha, but that of Mao as well. Progressive labor talked tough, worked arduously at building a base for the coming revolution, and popularized Mao's Little Red Book before anyone else saw its commercial possibilities. Indeed, we lived by and for the book. What is to be done? Here, read this. One step forward and two steps back. Or is it two steps forward? I could never get it right. We studied Hegel and took target practice out at the Coyote Point police range, right under the snouts of the pigs, and held secret meetings at the International House of Pancakes, where we wondered if it was time to go underground yet. Mostly, we criticized ourselves and each other for not being revolutionary enough. This is the group whose political program Putnam chose to identify with as a card-carrying member for four years of his life. One indication of the intensity of Putnam's activism is that he himself said that during that phase he was never able to function as a philosopher. Indeed, he had a period of particularly low output precisely between 1968 and 1972, as pointed out in De Gainsford 2006, 3. Perhaps this should not be surprising. One cannot publish much if one believes that the most important truths are contained in a little red book. Three issues merit our attention here. First, the very fact of Putnam's long loyalty to the PLP. Second, his later comments on this episode. And third, the reactions of other philosophers. In a 1970 article that starts with Marx's 11th thesis on Feuerbach, Philosophers have hitherto only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. Putnam called on liberals to move further to the left and participate in the radical task of remaking our world, the true task of philosophy. There is nothing extraordinary about an Ivy League professor yearning to get out of his academic bubble 
and become relevant. If he wanted to get involved in some kind of misty-eyed revolutionary activity, that's also unsurprising. There have been many such cases. But a highly intelligent one, accomplished philosopher and exceptionally clear and rigorous thinker with some knowledge of politics, joining a party that glorifies Maoism, and staying in that party four years, in the middle of the Cultural Revolution? Something is very wrong here. Of course, being wickedly smart in philosophy is compatible with having silly political views, as we have already seen, but it is hard to reconcile it with that level of protracted silliness. Could it be that Putnam somehow failed to be informed about what was going on in China at the time? This is extremely unlikely. The reports about the terrible events there could have been missed only by someone who had been living on another planet, Twin Earth, perhaps. How did the ideology Putnam was extolling work in the real world? Among other things, it included scenes of class enemies wearing dunce caps and others being forced on the stage bowing their heads in shame, with signs hung around their necks explaining their wrongdoings. Many of his colleagues in China were exposed to the same kind of public humiliation. Some of them were also brutally beaten up and killed. Books were banned and burned, all in the frenzied attempt to destroy the so-called Four Olds, old ideas, old customs, old culture, and old habits. Did Putnam, the Maoist, ever think about how much of the collection of, say, the Wiedner Library at Harvard would have to be burnt if old and useless books were discarded using similar ideological criteria? After all, on what grounds could he approve of what the Red Guards were doing in Beijing or Shanghai, but oppose the same thing in Cambridge, Massachusetts? In fact, Putnam advertised the Cultural Revolution to his own students. He used to speak on a podium and advise them to read Mao's Little Red Book. Inside the Chinese Utopia How much did Putnam know about the situation in China? Surely he must have at least been following the New York Times, which on January 2, 1970, published a long article headlined, The Making of a Red Guard. It was written by a former Red Guard who had managed to escape from mainland China to Taiwan and who gave a detailed and harrowing report about how he and his fellow students had horribly abused their own teachers, all in the name of Maoism. The essay was hard to overlook, as it was splashed across seven pages of the newspaper. At 12 o'clock on June 12, as a few of us were on our way back from a swim, we heard screams and shouts as we approached the school gate, and some schoolmates ran up to us shouting, The struggle has begun. The struggle has begun. I ran to the athletic field and saw rows of teachers, about 40 or 50 of them, all with black ink poured over their heads and faces to make them truly a black gang, a term used from the beginning of the Cultural Revolution in condemnation of intellectuals. Hanging on their necks were placards with such words as reactionary academic authority so-and-so, class enemy so-and-so, corrupt ringleader so-and-so, capitalist rotor so-and-so, all taken from the newspapers. On each placard was a red cross, making the teachers look like condemned prisoners awaiting execution. They all wore dunce caps painted with similar slogans and carried dirty brooms, shoes, and dusters on their backs. Hanging around their necks were pails filled with rocks. They were barefoot, hitting broken gongs or pots as they walked around the field, shouting, I am black gangster so-and-so. Finally, they all knelt down, burned incense, and begged Mao Zedong to pardon their crimes. I had never before seen the tortures I was to see here, eating night soil or insects, being subjected to electrical shocks, forced to kneel on broken glass, being hanged by the arms and legs. During this period, the worst shock to me was the fatal beating of my most respected and beloved teacher, Yang Xinyang. Teacher Yang, advanced in age and suffering from high blood pressure, was dragged out at 11.30, exposed to the summer sun for more than two hours, then paraded through the streets carrying a placard and hitting a gong. He was dragged up to the fourth floor of a building and down again, being savagely beaten along the way. Imagine, a man over 60 years of age. He passed out several times, but was brought back to consciousness each time with cold water splashed into his face. He could hardly move his body, his feet were cut by glass and thorns, but his spirit was unbroken. He shouted, Why don't you kill me? Kill me! 
This lasted for six hours until at last he collapsed. Many outsiders did not realize that a lot of the teachers of the people whose sudden deaths during the Cultural Revolution were officially certified as natural, and many communist cadres who were later declared dead due to illness or declared missing by the Red Guards actually died under torture. And yet, even after this disturbing story disclosed some of the horrors of the Maoist Cultural Revolution, Putnam remained the member of the Maoist Party for another three years. Why? Here is, to the best of my knowledge, the only place where he addresses that question. Why didn't you know all this in 1968? Will be asked, especially by my social democratic friends who were never tempted by the vision of Marxism-Leninism. Well, I did know about the gulags. That is why I joined a group that supported no existing state. But I found within the group itself the same contempt for genuine discussion, the same manipulation, the same hysterical denunciation of anything that attempted to be principled opposition that my father had found in the American Communist Party back in the 40s. Perhaps I was dumb. Certainly, I was depressed and desperate. This explanation will not do. If Putnam's former party was Maoist, isn't it clear that, contrary to what he says, it did support the political system and ideology of an existing state, namely China? Also, his complaints about all the bad things he found in the party may tell us why he eventually left it, but they are irrelevant for the much more interesting question, why did he join the party in the first place, and why did he stay in it so long? In his intellectual autobiography as well, Putnam focuses exclusively on his reasons for leaving the PLP. He explains that in the end he realized that not only was the PLP's talk about democracy a complete sham, the party leader's favorite expression about other liberal politicians, he should be shot, was not just an expression, but a symptom of their fixation on the fantasy of a violent revolution in which all rival political leaders and intellectuals would indeed be killed. So it took one of the 20th century's true philosophic giants a full four years of obedience to the PLP's leaders to figure out that they were actually dangerous people prepared to kill others over ideological disagreements. In a post on his blog, The Life of Hillary Putnam, Putnam stated that his involvement with the PLP was ultimately wrong and on the extreme side, but he failed to say what exactly was wrong about it. Yet he was quite specific about what he saw as virtues of the PLP. I did admire the PLP for their commitment to alliance building between nations, as well as their strong-willed attempts to organize within the armed forces throughout the country. Contrast this high praise of the PLP with Putnam's strident condemnation of American mainstream politics over the years. For instance, in an article first published in 1987, he mentioned with admiration the mathematician Norbert Wiener's announcement that he would no longer work for the U.S. Department of Defense. Wiener explained his decision by saying, I don't give four-year-olds razor blades. Putnam was not only impressed with Wiener's deep remark, he used it himself, pouring similar scorn on the Reagan administration's handling of the Cold War. So we continue passing out razor blades to the children, and the children continue promising not to use them. He explained further, I do not believe that it can possibly be right to help make weapons, any sort of weapons, under present conditions when we live under a government that does not, I believe, have the slightest desire for arms control at all, a government that refuses to move in the direction of reducing the danger of nuclear war. That much seems clear to me. A huge and obvious irony of the situation was completely lost on Putnam. The highest officials in the American government were being likened to little children by someone who just a few years earlier admired an unhinged and violence-prone sect for its attempts to infiltrate the American armed forces throughout the country. Now, who exactly is more like the four-year-olds here? In a long article, two experts explain China's cultural revolution. Trying to comprehend the incomprehensible, readers were informed that Red Guards 10 to 18 years old were the masters of Beijing for months while the police were forbidden to intervene. Hence, another irony. Putnam condemned what he metaphorically described as giving razors to four-year-olds. But earlier, he himself glorified a leader who was reported by the main American newspaper 
to have let children, some of them literally 10-year-olds, terrorize a city of more than 7 million people. In one interview, Putnam comments very briefly on his involvement with the PLP. I was connected with a Maoist group. I am no longer a Maoist. The first sentence is an understatement. Not merely connected with a Maoist group, he was in fact a full and very active member. The second sentence, however, needs some unpacking in order to appreciate its full implications. What the statement, I am no longer a Maoist, really says is, I am no longer a supporter of the biggest mass murderer in human history. One would have expected here a follow-up question from the interviewer, because Putnam's terse remark screams out for further explanation. One would have also expected that at least some commentators or journalists would probe deeper and try to make some sense of the famous philosopher's descent into totalitarian madness. But there was no curiosity about this, and apparently there is none today either. It is almost as if this Maoist episode only spiced up Putnam's biography and in some people's eyes just made him look more cool and less boring than a typical academic. Would university professors have reacted with similar indifference and mild amusement if, in the 60s, a leading Harvard scholar had praised, say, the authoritarian regime in Spain and campaigned passionately to introduce Franco's political system in the United States? Of course not. And yet there should be no question that Mao's regime was incomparably more inhumane than Franco's. A troubling thought is that Putnam's evasiveness about his past may be a sign that he has never fully understood the enormity of Mao's crimes. Here is what he said in an interview many years after he abandoned his attempts to bring the Chinese communist utopia to America. Then we had two very atheist dictators, called Stalin and Hitler, who between them killed even more people than anyone had killed in the name of the sacred. How can one talk about murderous atheist dictators without mentioning Mao, especially if one had worshipped him for a long time and is now allegedly ready to recognize entirely the monstrous nature of Mao's rule? At one point, Putnam's party experienced a huge disappointment with the Chinese road to socialism and then took the Albanian turn. The climax to this relentless sectarianism came after Nixon's visit to Peking when the PLP broke with China herself for seeking a rapprochement with the USA. Only Albania remained, in all the world, wholly admirable. In brief, as long as Mao maintained his strict isolation from the West, the PLP considered him great, although he was killing and terrorizing his own people. But as soon as he allowed his country to establish contact horrors with the United States, his path had to be abandoned immediately. Now the PLP's utopia had to be built by dropping the old model and by emulating the political regime in Tirana. For almost a whole year, Putnam obediently followed this new party line that extolled Enver Hoxha as the only hope for the future of humanity. But Putnam's militant activism was not restricted to party politics. It also spilled over into his views about academic issues and led to vicious attacks on his own colleagues at Harvard and attempts at character assassination. In a 1972 talk at Princeton, he first gratuitously labeled the psychologist Richard Herrnstein as racist and then publicly urged that Herrnstein be fired from the university. The fact that Putnam's intolerance for different opinions sometimes went so far that he was willing to denounce other scholars in a way that trampled basic principles of academic freedom shows that, after all, Joining a Maoist party may have been an excellent fit for someone with his views on politics and scholarship.